And in a weird bit of alignment that was totally unintentional <laughs> on my part, uh, my last game is also <laughs> celestially themed in a way. <laughs> Go, -dum -bum. Go figure. We're Mandy, I think that says something about us more than anything else. We're in tune. I don't know. Girl, it's a we're, thing. we're aligned. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Druid City Games. It's time for the Salt and Sass podcast when we share our love for the wonderful world of board games with you, whether you're a gaming veteran or just starting your tabletop journey. Welcome to episode 23. I'm Suzanne. And I'm Mandy. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Here we are. It is July 2023. Mandy. I'm so warm. My house is so warm. I'm so warm. And I know that so much of the United States is kind of going through a heat wave right now. We're seeing all this news about the hottest days on record in the in the world right now. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's hot up here. I feel so, like, yeah, we whoop. had a little bit of a heat wave, but uh, it seems to have kind of subsided. I don't know. It's not too bad now, but it was pretty hot for a while. So I can only imagine what's happening out where you are. <laughs> Ooh, yeah it's warm i'm kind of anyway so oh, no. if i get a little sweaty for anybody watching sorry about that it's warm in here <laughs> mandy uh a couple weeks ago we streamed banner festival we uh went and had a lot of fun doing that that is again you know druid city obviously is a sponsor but i was oh. glad we played banner festival again because i kind of forgotten how fun the game is the game's super fun so that was great great game but i know that you've been streaming a bunch as well yeah so and and some yeah. new stuff on the streaming front so many things on the streaming front so i know some people only listen to the podcast and hey that's okay maybe some of this will entice you to check out a video or two if not that's okay too we appreciate all the support that we get uh but uh, let me start off by saying we will be moving all of our live streams to twitch so currently we kind of swing between doing some on YouTube, some live streams on Twitch, and then we port over any videos that were on Twitch onto YouTube. Going forward, Salt and Sass Games will be doing all of our live streaming on Twitch and then porting those videos over uh, to YouTube. So if you're not on Twitch, get on Twitch, check us out, come hang out. So uh, speaking of Twitch, uh, I've been streaming on their solo. Yes, I know what you're all saying. But we got to keep people engaged, right? So I thought I'd throw out a little, some solo streams and people have been wonderful in the chat. So I always appreciate the help. Uh, most recently, uh, actually, the time that we are recording this, I just, let me look for the title here. <laughs> oh, yes, here we go. Sherlock Holmes, The Shadow of Jack the Ripper. So it's uh, like a choose your own adventure, I guess you could say book, I guess, graphic novel. And uh, I did a little stream of that today uh, at the time of this recording on uh, Twitch. So it was really nice to have people in the chat come and help out. And then before that, uh, Beacon Patrol, which Suzanne talked about on the last podcast, uh, <laughs> it was a train wreck, as in, like, I did yeah. horribly. <laughs> So. It's 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 a, we as discussed last episode. It is a difficult game. Oh, it was so you know. I was too be gentle with yourself. I but... was too confident. I was like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and then I threw, let's throw both expansions in. Yeah, I knew it was a wasn't going to be a strong start when I'm like, wait a second. I think I was supposed to move on to the tiles after I place them. Oh my gosh, yes. So for like the first three moves. I didn't do that. And I'm like, oh, this seems really easy. Then I was like, oh, no, no, I need to do that. And then I started doing that. I'm like, yeah, this is this is not going to end well for me. So if you'd like to uh, enjoy just the chat or, hey, just see what the game's about. Not for my amazing gameplay. Let's be clear. <laughs> that's going to be up on the YouTube channel. And I think the, the VOD is on Twitch. So that's Salt and Sass Games. And I think before that, I did the Animals of Baker Street, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and we did eventually get to finding out who was the guilty party and uh, in that story. So that's also on uh, Twitch and YouTube. Oh, so that's just what I've been doing. Oh my goodness. We have- but wait, there's more. Uh, there's more. 
Sure. So we have uh, a friend of ours, uh, Stephanie Dusablon, and she's going to be doing uh, a solo RPG series on the uh, channel. So these will be uploaded to YouTube as they're not going to be live, but those are going to be some uh, series on solo RPGs. I know Suzanne and I have mentioned them, but we haven't really gone into greater detail about them. So this is what Stephanie will be doing and uh, she's hoping to do that weekly but we'll see how it goes if it's too much we might move it to bi-weekly but right now it will be a weekly uh, stream on YouTube and on the 25th I think it is that might change we'll see uh, I will be streaming with Stephanie so it's not gonna be a solo it's gonna be a duo of Wander Home so we're gonna do uh, a little stream about that. So if you're so into... excited! I'm hearing yeah. so many good things about Water Home. It's so good, and I talked a little bit about it on the podcast. But we're gonna continue our story. We'll see if we maintain the same characters or we start over. But we'll do a little snippet of that on a stream in a couple of weeks. So watch the socials. So uh, Twitter or uh, Salt That Salt and Sass Games or any of our other social media, which will drop at the end of the show. And if you're watching this, it's on screen where you can find out more about these streams. Wow. That was a lot. <laughs> oh, wait. There's something else I have to talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the last thing. Keep going, my... Mandy. You're not done. Oh, my you gosh. I know. Like, work to do. Oh, all the things. Um, so I haven't been playing actually that many video games. Even Diablo's had to take a, a bit of a backseat these days. I've just been, I know, I've been so busy with my day job sorting like, organizing other stuff for the channel but it's just i just really haven't had time to put into it uh but uh cottage cottage garden is the most recent app that i played on steam it's been in the steam library for quite some time i played the physical game i didn't really play the app too much so i was like oh so david and i did a stream most recently on that and that is also on the youtube channel so i like cottage garden um there are others I prefer <laughs> over Cottage Garden, but it's not a bad game. And I think I actually prefer the app over the board game. I, oh, I think I remember when I reviewed this many moons ago that I found the board game went on like a round or two too long. I found that it could have ended a little sooner. I think that was something I, I said when I reviewed the board game. But in the, vid in the okay. video or app, it's not that bad. But I swear to you, there's no... There kind of is a back button, but it's only to a certain point. So, like, I almost feel mm -hmm. like they needed to make it just, like, a step further there with that. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I swear, it's just certain apps. I forget to end my turn. And maybe this is a function I'm sure that I could turn on. So, like, once I've done a thing, it ends the turn or whatever. But I'd be sitting there chatting. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> forgot to press end my turn on several occasions. So, that's more of a me thing, but I probably should change that setting. But that is something that I'm not a huge fan of because I forget. So it's like, a, it's a lot of steps to end your turn is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, mm -hmm, but the mm -hmm. tutorial stuff is pretty straightforward. The music, OMG, turn that off. It's so loud. It's, and that's most video games, but this one was like obscenely loud. And um, yeah, so I ended up having to turn it off and just use like the special graphics. So that was really good. And um, it has little, like, bugs <laughs> that run across the screen. And yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I get, I see why, but a lot there were actually people watching the stream who found it a little distracting. So that is, again, going to be a personal thing. It's funny. I didn't notice it until someone pointed it out, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I see. But, again, for some people that might be distracting, some people might like that. So, overall, the game itself, it's pretty fun. I think a lot of people will enjoy it. The app for the most part was good. We had a couple little little bits that happened when David and I tried to connect. So playing with someone else I found could be a little fussy. Uh, but overall, I think the app is is fairly well done. So Cottage Garden, give it a try. I think it was on sale on Steam for like a couple bucks or something. So I don't know if it still is, but there you go. Excellent. Well done, you. Oh my gosh, I talked Well, yeah, and so I have much. not been, yeah. <laughs> Uh, honestly, like it's a very, very busy time for a variety of reasons. And so the only yeah. video game I've been playing is Tears of the Kingdom <laughs> still. Hey. Uh, and it's great. And, and I'm really enjoying it because I am playing it with my 11 year old. So he plays on, you know, his account and then I right. play on my account. So we're we're playing our own games. But, you know, I will tend to play ahead of him but he tends to watch guides so he'll give me advice and then I'll help him through some puzzles and then 
earlier today, in fact, I had to fight like this water boss and he goes, you know, can I do it for you? I'm like, sure, buddy, here you go. And yeah. what I'm sure would have taken me a dozen attempts, he knocked out in the first try because he's wow. just better at the maneuvering and things like that. So I was like, thanks, that's great. I don't even have to worry about that. So we're having fun with it, but uh, that's that's really all I've managed been playing on the video game front right now. So there you go. Oh, that's good. Keep you that that what eighty hours or so in that game or more, <laughs> so you'll have lots of lots to do. To finish oh it. yeah, that's it's massive. There's yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm thank God I'm not a video game completionist because that would be way <laughs> too <laughs> much. <laughs> so, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, it's a little light on the video games, but not so light on the crowdfunding games. Huh? Huh? Okay. I tried. Okay. You did good. You did good. <laughs> All right. So let's jump into some crowdfunding. I don't know. I feel like I'm not doing the usual like board game thing, which is fine, but I'm trying to, I'm thinking outside, <laughs> I'm thinking outside the box, the game what box. What a bum bum. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I know. I was actually I can, funny. the earlier segue I can forgive. That one was pretty rough, Mandy. I actually didn't even do that one on purpose. <laughs> I know. Well, it is a it is a turn of phrase. It's a common turn of phrase. That's but, you fair. Know. Here we are. Okay, so for my crowdfunding choice, I decided to talk about a magazine. So on Kickstarter, there's the Casual Game Insider board game magazine, and I believe this is their twelfth year of doing it. So if you're not familiar with it, well, they've been doing it for a little while. So it's on Kickstarter. Uh, it ends on the twenty first of July. So that's on a Friday. So I think when this posts, it's going to be not too long after that. And it's called, it's a print and digital magazine for fans of casual board games. That's that's literally the tagline. And this is put up by Chris James of Stratus Games. Uh, in the issues, we're going to talk about different things. We're going to talk about games or topics that are game related or related to casual board gaming. There's going to be strategic tips in gaming, conventions, recommendations, interviews, all the things that, you know, you can see on the YouTubes and the Twitch and stuff but in a magazine format. Uh, also, they're going to talk about, well, Suzanne's favorite, roll and write games, dice games, card games, solo, multiplayer, just like all the things. There's there's something kind of for everybody. So I do appreciate that. So if that's something that interests you, it kind of reminds me of when I used to get those magazines for uh, video games when I was younger. You know, the ones that give you totally. the Totally. Yeah, like Nintendo Power. Oh, I was yeah. a huge Nintendo Power fan. Yeah. I had them all. And then we'd be looking for like codes, you know, okay, how do we do this? And like get the yep. magazines. I mean, I don't know if this is going to do that for you, but at least, uh, you know, you'll get a, get your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the community. I'm just, that's me totally saying that. I don't actually know if that's the case, but you'll get some good board gaming content. So that's the Casual Game Insider Born Game Magazine ends Friday, July 21st, and that's on Kickstarter. Excellent. Well, I have a board game. <laughs> I, I feel so like you're you're so edgy with your, yeah. your other publications. And I'm just like, well, I got a game. But I'm, I'm excited about this one because this is from Coyote and Crow Publications, mm, nice. which exactly, right? And, um, this one is, uh, whereas Coyote and Crow did a very popular role-playing game recently, uh, all based on Indigenous people, uh, legends, and lore, this this is more of a traditional board game, but it's a semi-cooperative game that plays three to six, mm. and it is designed by Connor Alexander, who uh, is the owner of Coyote and Crow. And Coyote and Crow is a publisher that is dedicated towards promoting indigenous presence in analog games and they do a lot of great work so this is a semi-cooperative game and in many ways it's it's you know you play through some seasons you're going to be doing some simultaneous play and you are going to be getting resources to fulfill cards and then there's an interesting element where you are you can gift excess resources but you know as the receipt like yay resources right but on the receiving end, you may want to say no, because when you give resources, it gains status, right? And so 
if if you're I mean if you're offering me something I want to be like well do I I want the resources but do I want Mandy to gain status you know mm -hmm. so there's a, an interesting tension potentially in that give and take of resources and status and how we support each other and the background of this game is that apparently there and and this is something I was unaware of but this is one of the things I love about kind of more conscientious publishers is I I learn things yeah. so there is a a, a myth that is told about two wolves, one black and one white, representing good and evil and kind of creating this dichotomy. And this game was inspired to combat that myth. First of all, it's apparently attributed often to the Cherokee people. Mm -hmm. And apparently it's not a Cherokee myth, but kind of placing that mythic Right. you know woo, spirituality or whatever yeah. on of course indigenous people right. uh, but it's really a game about balancing the needs of the individual with the needs of the group and really trying to uh, uh not just dis dissolve distribute uh, to get rid of that concept of like it's black or white it's good or evil it's it's win or lose and mm -hmm. this is where that semi-cooperative comes in the idea that it's it's better when you work as a group, when you work as a team, when you work as a pack and things like that. So a lot, it's, it, there's, the gameplay doesn't look too heavy, but I really think that there's some very thoughtful elements behind how the game was inspired and how the game mechanisms come around a very specific purpose. And so that is on Kickstarter. It ends August 7th. It looks beautiful. And once again, uh, Coyote and Crow, emphasizes making sure that their illustrations and things like that are uh, contributed by indigenous people. And also they have a no plastics commitment in this game as well, trying to be environmentally mindful as well. So a copy is $55 plus shipping. It ends August 6th. It plays three to six and it is on Kickstarter. So check out Wolves if that sounds compelling to you. In fact, it does. So I'll have to check Ooh. it out. I feel like I'm on Kickstarter and sometimes things don't always show up for me. I don't know if it's the search I'm doing or whatever so I didn't actually even see this one on the list so I'm gonna have to well you know and it's one of those things dive. now we have three very active crowdfunding sites that have board games on it and there's there's so many games or game like you know and Kickstarter is a great example where I'm I'm trying to look for new games not that I need to back more but you know <laughs> just, just browsing just yeah. peeking and um, and, you know, I'm because of the way the categorization works on Kickstarter specifically, it's like I'm scrolling through, like, ooh, you know, sexy 3D printable oh, files, geez. SQL files for, yeah. you know, for the bells of the West with big bosom 3D <laughs> SQL files. And look, if you want big bosomed Western women wearing bandanas over their bosoms, like, more power too. But it's not something I'm interested. I don't want us. I don't, I can't, I don't have a 3D printer. I can't print out SQL files, even though, you know. And then there's like a bunch of like role playing accessories, like buildings, which look great. But again, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, that's not something I'm personally interested in. It's not something that I'm looking for, for example, for this show. Right. And so it's e because there's so much on there, Mandy. My whole point is that I think it's very easy to miss projects. And that's why we do this segment because we don't want you, there are, there are projects that we don't want you to miss and we want to highlight them. Yes, exactly. But now it's like, oh, now I got to go through and, filters through all the things <laughs> all the things all the things we'll just leave it there <laughs> all right mandy we've got some games that we've been playing i've actually got a ton of game nights coming up in the next few days too but i managed to squeak some games in as well here to talk about so you want to move on over there yeah let's take a look at some games well I am a bit light on the games, uh, but uh, hopefully by next podcast, I'll have some rolling in, but I did get to play a couple of good ones. So I know Suzanne also got to play this game and uh, she can jump in uh, while we talk about it. So Pier Pyramido, why did I say that? Like I had a French Wait, accent. Avec Francais, accent oh, Francais. Oh my gosh. I'm so yeah. sorry, everybody. Pyramido. Pyramido? Wow, the struggle is real. Pyramid with an Ray o. Mido. Pyre Mido. This is a problem for me. I'm so sorry, everybody. I don't know why I said that with like a French accent, but <laughs> anyway, that's where we're hey, going you're to. Pyramido. We're going to go with that. It's designed by Iquan Kwan, and art is by the Creation Studio, and the publisher is Synopsis Games. It's for two to four players and plays in about 45 minutes. 
This, everybody, is a pre-order, so it is not available yet. I know, tisk tisk, but it's coming, and it's going to retail for about $42 Canadian, so keep an eye on it. <laughs> so, Pyramido, it's a tile placement game, and, oh boy, this is, this is, this is a tricky one. So, <laughs> you're going to play it over, I believe it's two, three, four rounds, and uh, you're building up, so you've got a selection of tiles. That you're going to like a pyramid. Like price right. Price is right. Um, hold on. There's something in my eye. I swear. Suzanne's like, check it. Is there something in your eye? You should go take it out. And what did I say? It's fine. Just record. And now I'm like, oh, there's a hair in my eye. Okay. Glad you got that colorful uh, explanation. Here we go. So, <laughs> in Pyramid, oh, it's a tile tile placement game and like Suzanne says you are trying to kind of build a pyramid and the tiles have different colors on them so there's like red blue like a turquoise yellow green brown there are a few of them and then there are matching pieces that go with them and these images are also on some of the tiles we're like okay that's great who cares well this is important because <laughs> having those symbols on the tiles and then a then being able to place the matching wooden symbol on this tile is going to get you to score points. So what's going to happen is when you set up the game, you have pile piles of tiles. <laughs> I like that. Piles of tiles. And <laughs> then you're going to have tiles uh, in front. So you're going to, there are going to be three tiles to select from. So kind of in between the piles of tiles. And uh, those are going to be the ones that you can select on your turn to put into your grid. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Suzanne, the grid was like four by five, or it was a really four by five four by five it's a very yeah that my memory's on fire today That's good <laughs> so it's a four four by five grid which you're like oh yeah that sounds pretty big pretty easy you say that now wait till you start playing omg so you pick your tile and you know there might be a certain color you want to pick but you decide let's say i'm going to pick this tile that has it's half yellow half brown and some of them could be all one color but you're going to pick that half yellow half brown tile put it on your mat or play area and when you place a tile, you have the wooden tokens that match the symbols that you will find on these tiles. So because you have two colors, you're going to choose if you're going to put the yellow marker down or if you're going to put the brown or whatever color I said down. So let's say I picked the yellow. Now that tile, if you surround it with more yellow that have symbols on them, you're going to get to score those points. Makes sense, right? You do also have these cards that you can put on tiles. And when you can do this, it kind of matters. But you can put those on tiles to maybe cover a color. You're like, oh, I don't really want that color because it's kind of blocking the little score situation I have here. But you only get like, I think it's like three or four of those cards that you can use for the entire game. So if you use them all in that first round, well, you're out of luck and that's, they stay as they lay. All right. So once you've done your five, four, five by four grid, you do a scoring. So you're, you're checking for things, the colors that have the wooden token in that area. They're attached to other like colors and they have the symbols. Uh, so you would count the symbols of those colors for each one. Check your points. And then you're going to go to the next round. So here's where it gets tricky because you're building above. So on top of what you've already done. So now it becomes, okay, numbers are hard for me, Suzanne. So we go from a five, five by four, four by five to a... Whatever slightly smaller is of that. Uh, like a three by four. Three by four? Okay. Wasn't I sure think. If it okay. Well, four by, yeah. I, yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah. Anyway. It gets smaller. You have to go like one, one, one half measure smaller. Correct. So basically it's not hanging over the edge. You're going to be able to see the edge of the bottom that you've built. Uh, so we're going to do the same thing all over again, but in a smaller kind of grid area. Now keeping in mind those bottom ones, if they're connected to any colors that are on that second layer. So for example, let's say I have a corner that has some red and I've been able to place tiles that are have that red and the symbol, you know, I've marked them. Those will count towards your score. So the bottom ones just don't go away. They can still be very useful or valuable. So you want to keep that in mind. So you're going to do this over and over again until you get to four rounds. And when you get to the last round, I think you're placing, what is it, like one or two tiles? Like Yeah, the last round is... Boop, it's plop. one tile that's it like so you gotta make it work and see what happens so sometimes it's really good sometimes it's kind of bad so uh and that's it so you play until that's done count up all the points from all the rounds and whoever has the most points wins at first i was like oh gosh i'm gonna be really bad at this game like i mean i still was kind of actually no i was actually pretty good at this game now that i think about it <laughs> so I really liked the fact that you weren't just working on the same level. Like, yes, I know it's a whole pyramid theme, but I like that you had to like move to that next level 
and make it smaller. So now you're just like, okay, now you actually have to physically sit there and think about how am I strategically going to place them? Because you can rotate the tiles to work in your favor, right? And then it gets to a decision at one point where you're like, oh, I actually am going to probably just have to cover some colors completely and maybe just focus on making a bigger area of that one color, which is hard because you want to touch on all the things, but when it gets to the end, you just can't, right? So you have to kind of make that sacrifice. And I like that. I like things that makes you kind of go, oh, I want to do all the things, but maybe I need to just focus on the one thing. And then you kind of have that back and forth in your head. There's a little bit of denial. I don't care what anyone says. Sometimes I will purposely pick a tile. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I was playing with my friend Matt and, you know, his fiance. And I'm like, um, I'm like, Ryan, I think Matt wants that tile over there. And she's like, oh, I better take it then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, specifically, right, the way that Mandy mentioned those four piles, and sorry to interrupt you, but I, no, I please, thought this was a please, really please. interesting part of the game. You have these stacks of tiles, but you only have three that are available to you, and it kind of works like a semi-pyramid as well. Right. And so when you take a tile, it there are two stacks adjacent to that space. You get to pick which tile mm -hmm. fills that space. So absolutely, it's, it's this not it's it, not a denied draft because it's you're not necessarily taking the tile right. that somebody wants it's what tile you are giving them as an option so it's, at least for us so it's like when you are looking at those two two stacks you're looking at the next player going oh right well you're working on the teal color i'm not going to put this teal color tile i'm going to give you the one that has the red brown and and it, it's not a denied draft it's like a deny push or deny yeah. select and i don't know i don't know how to yeah, yeah, yeah phrase it but i thought that that was actually a really uh cool part of the game you know it is no and thank you that's actually really important so i'm glad you you pointed that out and it's true though because you have to pick a tile that you want to work for you because the picking of the tile is important because then the next tile that comes off is from one of the two piles from where you picked so you're, you're it's kind of like a double thought there so you're like oh my gosh i need this but if i take this and, you know, potentially both of the piles are something that that next person could use. Well, you're just like giving it to them. So you're going to have to make that balance. Now, in the copy that I got, and I don't know if you got this as well, Suzanne, I did get there were accompanying mats that came with it. Uh, and the mats did depict some of the symbols that you'd see uh, on the tiles in the game. I'm not really a mat person. It really depends on what it what it is and its function. So for me, they were very pretty. And they were really nice with the game, but they weren't, uh, they didn't have any kind of like lines to tell you where to put uh, tiles or things like that. So it's a nice accessory. It's nice to have. Do you need the mats? Not necessarily. If you like mats, great. They're very pretty. And then they're just kind of like a nice to have, but they're not required. Um, right. Trying to think the tile component quality themselves seem to be pretty strong. I mean, they had yeah, wooden no, components. They were, yeah, 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 I thought it was really good. Uh, there's a little score pad that you get to, to calculate your, score i mean i'm noticing a lot of games that we're not even including score pads so i don't know if that's so it's very basic which is fine i mean it's not a big deal you could use something else to mark this down so but other than that the component quality was uh very good in this game i feel like i'm missing something but no like that suzanne sure, you have some thoughts no. you talk about scoring and um, yeah. did you want to add any thoughts to it as well because i know obviously you played it and i know you added a little bit there but is there anything else you wanted to touch on that perhaps i missed uh, I don't know if you missed anything. I think you mentioned it earlier, but I kind of want to lean into it is that your foundational, like your first layer has, it matters. Oh, so what yeah. you're going to, because they carry up and you're scoring icons. So all of a sudden you're trying to not only pick colors, but you're trying to get out icons on the outer rim because those are the ones that are going to stay visible for future rounds. And as you are going up and as your play area gets smaller, exactly what Mandy was saying, you have to make a choice. There's going to be a moment where you have to make a choice and that is deliciously tense and maybe you hose yourself. The little cover card. So at first we kind of made, first we kind of joked about the <laughs> cover card quality because they're like very right. fine quality card stock. But then right. we realized because they actually go on the tiles, it's better that they're thinner because then it doesn't disrupt the level evenness yes. of the tiles. So then we were like, oh no, that makes total sense. Right. Uh, and that was that was totally fine by us after we realized their purpose. They actually are very <laughs> functional that way. <laughs> but potentially saving one until later the game is really, mm -hmm. you might want to think about it <laughs> because it can be a power move at the top because you could place one at the top Yes. at the end of the game and score two colors instead of one. 
But there's some interesting math in how that works because not only do you score all the icons for your little wooden tokens, but you score your smallest right. group as well. So you kind of can duplicate a group and there's some interesting end game math on whether it right. pays off that way or not, which is cool, <laughs> right? It's cool. So it's a little bit of like Acropolis or number nine where mm -hmm. you're building up, but the, the scoring is different and it makes sense in context in a, in a very pleasant way. And I think for us, uh, now, we haven't played it a bunch yet, but for okay. us, it was a pretty, like, we had a pretty positive response to it. We really enjoyed it and Good. really saw the potential of that progressively shrinking play field and how that worked. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. That's that, that's exactly how we felt about it. There was some downtime, I mean, depending on who you're playing with. So we did have some people who really had to think about their turns uh interesting we yeah i'll not, be honest we we personally did not encounter that now i did play with people who are not like people who play games on a regular basis that makes a difference oh, and then i well, did good, yeah. play with uh people like you know my usual game group and they were like we were pretty snappy with it so i guess it just really depends on who you're playing with it wasn't a massive amount of downtime so pyramid Pyramido is very good. I enjoyed it. As you can hear, I'm sounding like Suzanne and her game group enjoyed it. So definitely one that I think you should all uh, consider checking out. All righty. First game up for me this episode is Gartenbau. Gartenbau is, or I, I apologize. I'm sure I'm not saying that well at all. Gartenbau is designed by David Abelson and Alex Johns. It's got art and illustration and graphic design by Matt Cap Matt Paquette and Todd Sanders. Mandy, I know you know Matt Paquette, right? He's Canadian. From, my, oh, from the same place I am, O-Town. And Todd <laughs> Sanders is interesting. Todd Sanders is a game designer and, and writer and, and very creative person in his own right. Uh, and so that's that was that was cool to see. I had no idea until I actually was looking at the credits <laughs> that, for the podcast. Ah. And it's published by 25th Century Games. Nice. Uh, Mandy, you and I were talking about earlier, this was on a crowdfunding campaign yeah, a I'm year or so ago. Pretty sure it was. Yeah, exactly. But now it's out there in the wild. It fulfilled, and and we all can access this game. It's not a pre-order. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Throw me under the bus. <laughs> uh, so Garden Brow is a tile laying game, and it's got this beautiful vintage illustration, uh, floral illustration on the cover. And basically, you're going to have rectangular tiles that are like dominoes, which actually is similar to Pyramido in a way, right? And then there are a few square tiles as well. And these tiles represent seeds, plants, and flowers. So you're kind of going up. Oh, my gosh. I just realized, Mandy, this was total accident. But Pyramido and Garden Bio actually have a fair number of things in common Ooh, in some ways. Okay. Weird. Detail. I love it. Oh, yeah. It's because Garden Bio is a tile laying game that uses domino shaped tiles and you build up. Oh. <laughs> okay. But they're, uh, you know, at a high level, there's some similarities, but sure. they're very different games. So seed tiles just will have different flowers on them, yellow daisy, a red rose, whatever, or you could have a tile with two red roses and whatnot. There's a whole bunch of these different tiles. And you're going to uh, also have rectangular tiles that are considered plants, and they'll have one illustration of a pretty flower on it and then some icons on it. And then you're going to get square tiles that are flowers, and these have a pretty illustration on it and a bunch of requirements and points on it and an ability on it as well. And that's kind of the progression. You're going to put down seeds so that you can put down plants so that you can put down flowers and score hopefully very well throughout the game. The way that you're going to get these tiles is that there's a big, well, not a big, but, well, it's a big flower <laughs> in a central board. And on the petals are where you're going to be moving your little pawn. And on mo many of the petals, you, that's where you're going to put stacks of these seed tiles, the domino-shaped tiles. And there's some water and sun icons on them. Water and sun are two resources in this game as well. And then in between those piles, there are little yellow dots that are also spaces that you might potentially want to go to. So on your turn, you're just going to move to the next available petal. And you may take either the tile or the resources that are printed on the petal, your choice. Cool. And then if you take the tile, you put it into your tableau immediately. Kind of typical things. You know, it has to be adjacent to an existing tile, that kind of thing. Or you can stop at the dot. If you stop at a dot in between petals, that's right. when you can take one of the next level, the plant, the rectangular plants. Mm -hmm. To take a plant, you have to have the 
you have to pay a certain amount of resources. And each stack of plant tiles, it's the same plant all the way down, but they get more and more expensive. So the first person to draft an iris is going to get the iris for the cheapest uh, amount. Okay. And then, you know, then the next one gets more and more costly. And then to play the iris, you it will have uh, icons at the top indicating what seeds that flower has to cover. So it might have a purple and a yellow flower up there. That means to place that tile, you have to be covering up a purple and a yellow mm. Uh, flower on the board from the seedlings. So that's right. what you're doing. You're planning from step one. You're looking all the way up the chain going, okay, I got to put a rose here and an iris here and a daisy here and another daisy there. And then I can put that plant there and I have to have two sun and three water for that. And then that's going to get more expensive. Mandy's going to get that before <laughs> I am. So I better save up or skip that. And then like, oh, but then I want to put my flower out here. And then you're looking at these flowers because they not they also have abilities and you can also choose as a basically a free action to put out a flower okay. that has to cover up two plants <laughs> and there are also requirements on these flowers so a flower may say i have to be on top of an iris and a daisy or whatever it is i don't i'll be honest i don't remember all the specific flower breeds and if you can do that then you get the points you get the ability and all that good stuff uh, and the game ends when four of those petal tiles are drained oh. and you see who has the most points. Points are basically a cal calculated top-down view on what you can see. So how many of those plant and flower car cards can you see because they have points on them. And then for your flowers, they may score based on other seeds and stuff that you can see. So top-down view scoring and whoever has the most points wins. Okay. It, it, it's tough. It's a difficult <laughs> game. So it, it's very, very simple rules-wise, okay. but you can play this game at two different levels of st strategic focus. Okay. Because honestly, when you get your hand of these flower tiles, you have goals that you are aiming for. So you can be pretty thoughtful all the way back down the chain to know these are the seeds I need to get those flowers, to get these, to get those plants, to get these flowers mm. out. That's a lot. Right. It's a lot of planning that you can do. You don't have to. And if you play it a little lighter, it'll move much more quickly. But if you are a planner and a min-maxer, it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of thinking you can do from the very first few tile placements. Okay. And because there's another element where some of those flower tires abilities, some of them are more valuable early in the game, late in the game. And plants and flowers have points. So there's also some weird math that starts to kick in where you're like, oh, I can place this over these two flowers. Those two flowers revealed give me 12 points. Okay. I'm covering them up with this flower, which gives me 16 points. So I only get a bump of four points. Mm -hmm. But this other tile I have scores <laughs> off of those plants. So do I want to, like, it, it, so not only can you be very strategic in how you get these tiles out up the chain, right. then there's a lot of potential mathiness mid to late game about what your priorities are and the things you want to do. Then that all collides with the randomness of the seeds on the petals. Oh, boy. Because if you are like, great, I have to have a rose and a daisy next to each other. And to get a rose, you have to have two red seeds out next to each other, but the red tiles <laughs> keep on getting drafted away from you. Right. Or somebody is on that pedal when it's your turn, you have to skip over it. Mm -hmm. That's tough. And oh, so then okay. it's like, well, when do you pivot? When do you adjust that kind of thing? So it's, it's for such a pretty and lovely, th like thematically, it's lovely. Rules wise, it's pretty straightforward. It, I I think it's a very challenging game if you are trying to play pretty strategically. I think if right. you play it at a lower level of like effort, mm -hmm. it's it's a little smoother on that way. If you just kind of go, it's okay. It'll be okay. <laughs> just make a pretty garden, score some points, have a cup of tea. You'll right. be happy. I think, I, I think it's more enjoyable that way. The other hitch that we've encountered is mm -hmm. 
the iconography. So the tiles oh. are very, all of the illustrations are gorgeous. The game is beautiful. The component quality is great. It's a lovely, lovely production. The challenge that we found is on the plant tiles, specifically the thin rectangular ones, there are icons at the top that indicate what seeds you need to have. They're okay. very, very small. And depending on where you are sitting in relationship to those stacks, they're very hard to see. So we were in a situation oh. where people were taking photos of them right. so they could see because you kept on mixing up. And they're color-wise, they're – because color-wise, it big, they mm -hmm. may be fine. They Like the purple and the blue may be different enough. Right. But when you shrink that icon down – the purple and the blue all of a sudden become very, very similar okay. to each I'm other. looking it up as you're talking about it. And there was one game we played in which a player completely hosed themselves because they had thought something that was blue was actually purple. Uh -huh. And they had been building up their purple thinking that they could get that blue stuff. Uh, and they were wrong. And, mm. you know, it's like, well, what do you do? Do you grant them leniency? Because right. that's what they, you know, that kind of thing. But, but really, it had really mess them up yeah and to be fair the icons are the same all the way down it's the cost that changes which is very visible because they're big just simple water drop or sunshine icons um but it in a game that is actually fairly thinky and i've said this before yeah. when games the heavier the game or the thinkier the game the more you want to reduce unnecessary cognitive load right with the graphic design you want players focused on the choices that they have to make not what are the choices if that mm. makes sense you yep. don't want them to have to think about is that purple or blue is that purple or blue wait is that purple or blue again and again right you want them thinking about well is it better for me to go for this tile or that tile that kind of thing so your mileage is going to vary on that mm. maybe my friends and i are all just old even though i'm the <laughs> oldest one in the group but you know i don't know but it was something that came up a couple of times that um added frustration to the game right and uh but again you know it could be just us and beyond that it is a very pretty production so you know i say gar and, and the game's fine like the game is it's a solid little tile laying game it's a beautiful production it's it's got a great theme to it for us it's one it, for me it's one that i just want people to understand what it can be so they go right. in with their expectations set uh, so that's because I think you look at it and it's like, oh, it's a lovely little so garden. Pretty. And it's like, oh, no, depending on like if you got that person in your group that's like super min maxi and things like that, like that you got to know going in. Right. That there's a lot of thinking that you can do in this game. And for a lot of players, that is like, oh, I thought it was just <laughs> this little light, you know, girl, cute garden game. But now yeah. you're telling me all this potential strategy and min maxing and all of the math calculations and all of a sudden it rises in their interest right it just depends on what you want in that moment from the game so Absolutely. that is Gartenbau. i did see that game and i too thought oh it's so pretty <laughs> you know at the ranch I'm like, and it is boy it's pretty it's just but... it's just more more than maybe the cover implies it's like venus flytrap kind of it's like oh, oh it's so cool in there now good analogy good analogy well like done it. you oh, i'm on a roll today but <laughs> well we've moved from plants to space Totally not in the same realm at all, but I know this is another game that Suzanne has also played, so we can talk a little bit about it together, but Starry Night Sky. So for those watching, I don't know why it's so hard to see in the background. I think it's just because it's a little dark, but it's, hold on, I can't get my finger. There we go. It's the one that's yeah. right there. The box is actually very pretty. So if you are watching the podcast, we'll be able to see it. If not, you should definitely uh, take a peek online for Starry Night Sky. It's designed by Emma Larkins. Art is by Nim Ben Ruven, and it's published by Buffalo Games. Buffalo Games is new to me, actually. I don't think I know Buffalo. They're Games. a mass market game publisher. That oh. have, they have a lot of games on the shelves at like Target and Walmart, things like that. Well, see, see, see I, I'm learning the things that you know you get to learn. So thanks, Suzanne, for that. Uh, it plays two to four players in about thirty to forty-five minutes, and I could not find it on Canadian sites. I only found it, uh, or the one it that Target exclusive. Is that what it is? Because I only found it on Amazon. Okay. Which they translated to Canadian dollars, so it ended up coming up at about forty Canadian dollars. And okay, promotion. okay, yeah. But I'm glad you said that. So there you go. So it could potentially be a target target exclusive which then means that we still don't get it here in canada 
So I'll get you some targets. Uh, well, we had it, and well, they ruined it here. Not Target. Anyway, that's a whole other <laughs> discussion. I love Target. Oh. <laughs> so, oh. And Starry Night Sky. It's actually a pretty straightforward kind of game. You have a board that has these, I guess it would be constellations would probably be the best way to describe them. And they're on like different rings of the board and they have names and uh, different kind of star symbols on them. So like the requirements you need to kind of complete that constellation. And, like red, uh, yellow, or blue. Exactly. And there are matching uh, tokens or gems of the same colors because those are what you're going to be able to use to complete them and those are your little stars and there's those are going to be in a bag so we're going to be pulling those out uh you have your player boards where you have like these little what's the word i'm looking for suzanne where you hold your gems <laughs> they call them pools like star pools, yeah basically. star pools just three circles on your player board i was trying to be fancy but i don't know why i did that so yes there it is <laughs> I mean, but maybe that's that's why our partnership works you are the fancy and and you 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 have that. I'm just like it's three circles. <laughs> Sometimes you need that though. I was trying to make it fancier than it actually was. So three circles. This is where you're putting your stars in the pools, but you're limited to how many that you can have in each pool. And then also you have these um, objective cards that we're going to have in the beginning of the game that you're going to get that you're going to try to complete for end game. So this is going to require you completing not necessarily you, but having certain constellations on the board completed it just may not be you that does it doesn't matter because they need to be done as long as they get done you're good to go and then we also have these other cards that are they almost look like little kind of like circle planet things and those are objectives that can be completed in game so as things happen oh you know i only had xyz colored stars in my pool or you know i was able to finish this constellation using only these colored stars or something to that effect and you can only hold so many before you can pull more but those are things that you can finish in game and they're usually anywhere between like one i think it's one and two or one and three points not more than that so it's a small kind of value so on the board you have these very cute little um telescopes i guess <laughs> as your like player pieces and you're gonna start uh, there's like a starting kind of area that you need to, that you are in. And then you can determine like where you want to go. Once you kind of enter into a constellation, uh, this is where you have an opportunity to complete it or at least add stars towards its completion. Okay. And then they have, remind me, Suzanne, there are the little, um, I don't know the name of them, the little round tokens that they have. It's almost kind of like a tracker for discovery the Discovery tokens. Thank you. Discovery tokens. And those will go into the constellations i don't know why i'm forgetting my words today holy moly <laughs> i'm struggling <laughs> and those can uh, be very useful because those can give you points as well depending on where they fall on the track um i think it goes anywhere from one to three points on that track yeah. as well so these are tokens that can also get you points this is one of those games sorry i'm jumping ahead because i'm just so excited to talk about this <laughs> so the game is going to end there's a track that'll let you know and then you end up playing um another round to finish that out this is one of those games where oh gosh your cards can align like the stars so well and other times sure. not at all so you'll be like oh this card worked really well and then this card you're like i absolutely none of it was completed but what's cool is that you don't need to complete it so somebody else can complete a constellation and that still counts as long as it's on your card and you know and I'm picking a random name. This is not necessarily one of the game, you know, like, you know, the, the mighty mouse or something. Do you know what I mean? And uh, you didn't finish it, but someone else did. Guess what? It doesn't matter. It's done. That's towards something that you can use. So this is where that kind of like family, I say family friendly, but the fact that you're, you don't specifically have to own that or have done that as long as someone has done it. So I did find myself kind of, yeah, to somebody else. Go that way. That's really good. Yeah, I think that's a good path for you. You know what I mean? I was like cajoling them into like going in that direction to finish it because I'm on this side of the board, like far right, and the constellation I need to finish is on the far left. I might not make that. So if somebody else can make it, do it. Like get her done. Uh, but definitely getting those points in game was super important. So at first when I played this game, I was like, ah, oh, maybe it's like too simple. Do you know what I mean? I was like, Sure. Yeah, it's just not enough. Yeah, I said that. And then somehow I managed to not finish my constellation. So what happened to Too Simple, Mandy? You should have been able to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the rules themselves are very straightforward, but there's some thought into how you want to play this. I'm greedy. I want to do all the things. Sometimes it's not possible. So you have to find other ways to get the points, maybe through the discovery tiles, maybe through finishing those in-game objectives. 
the goal of the game, I think, is meant to be of a more family friendly kind of game. I could be wrong about that, but that is definitely the vibe that I got from it. It's very pretty. Love the outside art. Love the I like black as a background with a very strong contrast. I don't know. I'm, I'm drawn to that. And I really I really enjoyed it with the kind of gold foiling and stuff. I'm here for it. So Starry Night Sky, simple set of rules, but really got your mind thinking and how you wanted to operate that board. I like that. And those kinds of games are super fun. So Suzanne, I know you played it as well. How did this go over for your group? I, so I've only played it once. Okay. And, you know, so take take that with a grain of salt. I, I, in general, I feel the same way. It's, it's a lovely game. It's tactile. Uh, the constellations aren't aligned to any actual... Sorry, yes. I should say that. <laughs> Greek uh, constellations. It's like the octopus or the the grumpy teacher yeah. or like all they're very they're very cute yes like, it, there's just a lot of charm in right. the game and so to me it's like are you comparing starry night sky to uh you know a, a, a vital lacerta game sure. that would be ridiculous absolutely so, Buffalo Games is a publisher focused on mass market games, which is putting games on, you know, the game sections in Target and Walmart and things like that, or on Amazon, where you might not have as experienced hobby gamers, or you might have people who are experienced hobby gamers, but might be looking for something that is something that they can draw their friends and family yeah. with. And I think Starry Night Sky is a game, like, it, it, it's it's a good match. The game and the publisher is a good match. Right. You know, they did a nice production. It's appealing. It's got a fun set of rules. Maybe I think your point about like anybody can complete the constellation and it counts for your score. Yeah, which is nice. It's little thing like you can. I had to ask this rules clarification. You can share a space with another player, yes. things like that, or you can jump over them. There's a lot of flexibility. It's not a punishing game. But there are interesting decisions in terms of where you're going, what you're prioritizing, how you're fulfilling, all that kind of stuff. And and so I think there's a really nice fit between what market this game is trying to hit and how well it does that. And and I we enjoyed it, even though, again, one play, but with very experienced yeah. gamers, we, we enjoyed it for what it was and and think it's a lovely game. And that's, and that's what it comes down to. And let me tell you how we made it so much more complicated than it needed to be. Seriously, like, I kid you not. Like, we played it. We're like, we. I think we wanted it to be hard for some reason because we're so used to playing sure. these games. So we're just yeah. like silly things. I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. What are we doing here? Like, why are we making this more complicated? Like, it says right here, this is what you do. Why are we trying to, like, make it complex? Restart. Restart. Change the mindset. Just play the game. So bear that in mind when you're playing it. You know, some of us like those heavy games, like you were saying, don't overcomplicate it. Just play it. So Starry Night Sky, we did enjoy it once we uncomplicated ourselves. <laughs> and in a weird bit of alignment that was totally unintentional on my part, uh, my last game is also <laughs> celestially themed in a way. Go, ba -dum -bum. Go figure. We're, Mandy, I think that says something about us more than anything else. We're in tune. I don't know. Girl, it's a we're thing. We're aligned. <laughs> uh, Distant Suns. This is a roll and write game. Da -da. <laughs> this is designed by Yun Min Jung and Gary Kim. It has illustrations by Vincent Dutre and it's published by Yellow. This plays up to four players, two to four players, and it plays over three rounds. What you're going to get is Everybody has a sheet of paper with a bunch of hexes on it that have like illustrate, you know, little icons and things like that. And on the right hand side, there's a, a panel of spots and icons, which if you've played roll and write games, there's a rhythm to the sheets that you'll often see. So it's yeah. a very standard looking sheet in some ways, which is not a criticism. It's just a descriptor. Yeah, it is what it is. But then what you get that is different is you get a board in the center and a bunch of tiles, a double layer board and a bunch of tiles. And so the tiles are indicating the icons or the different ways you're going to score and then the shapes that you will be drawing and then little pieces of the shapes themselves. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to set up this board and you're going to randomize which shapes are going to be included in this game. I think there's five or six spaces for it. And then you fill in these icon tiles and one small, but kind of nice detail is that the same icons go on both sides of the board. So you have it right in front of you. So if you're sitting across from other players, you both can see it right there in front of you. It's kind of a small, but nice detail. Cool. 
basically, and then there are these almost like figure eight shaped tiles, but one side is kind of squared off edges and one is a round edge. And the way that this game works, there's no dice. It's not a flip and right. There's no cards. It's these tiles. So the randomization element is really the other players. Mm -hmm. And what happens is in those spots around the board, there are little notches that these figure eight tiles can fit into. So you're going to pick up a figure eight tile and pick the pair of notches that you want to activate. And the way that that works is one side is for you, the active player, and the other side is for everybody else. So if okay. I put this into the, if I put my side into the V shape and the next door neighbor shape is the L shape, that means I get to draw the V shape and Mandy has to draw the L shape. Oh. Right? Now, if I slid it over, maybe I get the L shape and Mandy gets the T shape. I don't know. Right? So they always come in the pairs and the player who is the active player gets to determine what they get to write and what their opponents have get to write, which is an interesting thing. And depending on where those tiles are placed, each round may have like four or five turns. Okay. Cool. So yeah, then you get the shape. You're going to draw the shape on. You're going to outline the hexes on your board that match your shape and try to score points through three rounds of play. Now, the way that works is that, like, for example, there are alien icons scattered. Well, you want to cover up aliens. Aliens are bad. Get rid of those aliens. And then there are planets in the corners. You want to touch. You want to discover planets. You want to you know, arrange your shapes adjacently that you're pathing towards those planets and be, you know, if you're the first to discover them, you get more points than if you're, you know, second or third or fourth. Yeah. Uh, there are treasures on the on the board that you might want to surround or things like that. It it uh, or or touch or surround or depending on there's all sorts of different scorings. And then as you're doing things down the side, you can unlock bonuses and things like that, which is very a very common mechan mechanism in roll and rights in general. One small detail is you get cardboard punch outs of the shapes because they're little hexagonal abstract shapes polyominoes mm -hmm. made with hexes so they're a little more complex and so you actually get little pieces that you can use to map out well if i place it here what would that look like it's a very handy tool it's a very thoughtful tool to include for players especially for people who might struggle with spatial presentation a little bit more love that love that they included that it's a small thing but a very impactful thing i love that little detail Mm -hmm. So as you're playing through three rounds, at the end of the game, you're just going to score each of the icon, each of the, the shapes appropriately because each shape will score differently. And because you've randomized it game to game, you don't play with all the shapes every game. That's the randomization oh. at the beginning. And then that V shape, maybe the V shape is the alien shape in one game, or maybe the V shape is the treasure chest or the whirlpool, the black holes, you know, whatever. Right. So there's a lot of variability in the game and depending on the shape and the goals there's some synergy there's some pairings that are more synergistic than others which is good because everybody deals with the same pairing mm -hmm. so it's it's very fair it just adds different challenges depending on what your random setup is uh so yeah i i like distant suns overall i think there are some clever and unique elements that are founded in some very traditional roll and write mechanisms which is good right there's this it kind of balances some of the differences and newness i think the having the player pick the the my choice your choice thing is nice and i i just think it's a solid roll and write game i really enjoy it i think the variability is really intriguing so it's solid if you have two to four there's no solo i and, know i was looking for that shocking so yeah so there's no solo and it is capped at four because of the way that mm. the figure eight selection tool works right so i mean i think if that it's not even a criticism it's just kind of a oh gee you know i like this game enough that i wish it played solo or i wish it played yeah. a higher player count but no for the balance of the game it really only plays two to four players but beyond that it's it's a lovely little role in rank game and that's distant suns it's on the shelf. I got to play it. I was going to try and do it solo just to kind of see the rules and stuff. And then I realized, yeah, I didn't play solo. So I'll have to try and get it to a table at game night. Excellent. All right, Mandy, you you're on a speaking of being on a roll because you've been on you've been picking the game pies left and right. Game pies courtesy of you again. I know city building. Like, where did that even come from? <laughs> I think honestly, I think when I'm tired. 
oddly enough, it seems like I have a clear mind. Like, ah, let's do this one and get to it. When I have time to think about it, it gets real fluffy and abstract. <laughs> so, okay. Because I was wondering, I'm like, where did, like, uh, you know, we have a show notes doc that we share. And I opened it up and she's like, city building game. I'm like, I'm like Mandy, are you okay? Are you feeling all right? What's going on here, girl? I'm probably just tired. So it's clear. There it is. And I even threw in like a, I put a loose definition because I mean, not everybody might know what that means. And I definitely feel like city building games is something you hear in a lot of video games. But like, I know it does obviously exist in board games, but I know the term is often heard in video games. But I, I looked it up and this is kind of city building games compel players to construct and manage a city in a way that is efficient, powerful, and or lucrative. Now, I said loose definition, okay? Something in there. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of kind of what we're going for. So I'm looking at my first game and um, yeah, we'll say that's efficient. We'll go with that part. And that is uh, On Mars. <laughs> I've talked about this game several times on the podcast because it's so good. And it is a Vitale Lacerda game, which I'm a huge fan of. But it definitely is one of those games where you're first Martian colony and you're trying to contribute to the area you've come to and you're trying to build it up. Uh, and there are a variety of actions on the board that allow you to do this. Oh, this is one of those games where I really liked it. I got... I got it, but then I had to play it again to, like, get it. Oh, absolutely. I yes, love that you yes. understood that because I literally yep. just get, got, and emphasized, and you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not going to get into too many details because it's just a short game pie to tell you it's one of those games that falls into that category. But for those of you who haven't tried On Mars or potentially other Vitalis Serta games, On Mars is definitely one you should give a whirl. And I do feel it fits my city building in a outer I'll worldly experience yeah. <laughs> right, solid solid choice all right first up for me it's in the name folks carcassonne the city oh the best carcassonne i will not be taking any comments or questions at this time <laughs> yeah carcassonne i love carcassonne Who, you know, I, I i really do think carcassonne is a classic i i think it's a phenomenal game in so many levels but the city is the ultimate addition because in the city, you are also adding walls and, and uh, towers mm -hmm. around the border as you go. So you are boxing in the expansion as you play. And that's a critical element to the, to the uh, game because you are also creating rows and columns that you can view on and that also score in that way. The, the wall pieces add a nice visual element 3d sure. element to it and things like that it's it is such and just in the box carcassonne the city out of the box you don't need any, like it just plays so great it is the perfect carcassonne experience and i say that and i think even as a target realize i think it might be out of i hope not oh but it, it's i don't know but it's if you can hopefully you can buy it but if you can't you should find it and play it because it's great I haven't played it, so now like maybe I need to play it. And I think this is a game you've mentioned to me before. I oh, I love it. it. Yeah, I, I mention it when I can because I love. Actually, what it. am I saying? I'm coming to visit you. You can just show it to me. How about that? Yeah, the <laughs> list is getting longer, right? Yeah, we'll have to really speed up the gameplay. Uh, so the next city building game on my list, I feel like this is like the city building game in the video game and in the board game, and that's Anno 1800. So I don't know if you've played the video game, but that is literally what it is. It is build, build, build. And it translates into uh, the board game as well. You know, you have your board, you're trying to get your different uh, areas to build, you know, making glass or bricks or whatever it is. And, you know, other people need to come into town. Can I borrow some of that and use your factory? You sure can. You just got to pay me. <laughs> so you're definitely making some money by doing all that building. And, you know, you also have your cards and whatnot. They're going to uh, help you to hire people. Uh, gain resources, points, and that sort of thing. So uh, Anno 1800, if you didn't all know, is a very popular PC game uh, where you are literally doing just that city building. It is massive, uh, but it's a lot of fun. So there you go, Anno 1800. Excellent. I, I debated about this one 
just because I feel like I mention it or we mention it frequently yeah. enough, that I'm like, well, maybe I should mix it up a little bit. Ultimately, I just, I'm like, I love the game so much. Yeah. I got to put it on here. Throw it out there. And it's in the name. <laughs> Underwater Cities. <laughs> Underwater Cities, just a great, great, slightly heavier worker placement game in which you're building an underwater city and you're being clever about you know worker placement resources yeah. you've got these cool little domes and slightly fussy plastic power pieces <laughs> that you're stacking up in the in the dome next to the domes on your board it's just it's such a great game and to be honest i don't even know if it's really thematic like i don't know if i feel the theme overly the city theme in this but it's in the name so I'm putting it in the pie. It's underwater cities. I feel so. Like little bubbles almost give me like ecosystem there you building go. kind you. of thing. Thank so you, Mandy. I'm Thank here. you for the validation. I'm here. Good choice. Good choice. Thank you. So this next slice of pie is I I like destroyed this game. And not destroyed as in like I threw it in garbage. No, no. Like I played it a lot because I had so many people that's really Thank enjoyed it. Thank you for it. clarifying. Yeah, sorry. Like destroyed it. Like so good. Uh, it was King Domino. I don't play it as much now, but at the time I really played it quite a bit when it came out. And it's one of those ones where you're building your kingdom and you're using domino shaped tiles to do that. And uh, I love that we have a thing with domino tiles and building up and that seems to be the theme in today's episode but here we are in this you're you know building up your kingdom and trying to get you know certain areas to have more of a certain area to get more points and whatnot so again placement of tiles matters and a little bit of that denial happens here too i feel sometimes eh, maybe we'll see <laughs> so king domino uh it's actually one that I, I think is a really fun game and if you haven't tried it you should at least give it a whirl and uh see if it's one that you'd like to add to your collection excellent Next up for me, King Domino. I just read yours again. I don't know. My <laughs> eyes went through. I'm like, so God, excited. Well, that's not mine. That's so good. That's See? not mine. Because I, I like King Domino. I don't like it. I'll be honest. I don't like King really? Domino that I like much. So, yeah. Yeah, so, but like, no, it's, it's a decent game. Decent game. But sure. I'm like, it's just why, like... is, why is this word coming out of my mouth right now? Oh, my. <laughs> it's me. I put it's it in It's hot there. here, people. It's hot. God, give me, <laughs> give me some latitude. <laughs> Ginkopolis, Ginkopolis, and, and no comment about climate change and Ginkopolis <laughs> and me being hot and sweaty in my seat right now because Ginkopolis <laughs> is a, it's a city building game, but thematically it's called Ginkopolis because it's about like this ecologically mindful city that you're building mm. up. It's packed into the theme from the get go, uh, go figure. But <laughs> Ginkopolis is a slightly heavier Tile, uh, I don't even know, drafting. It's got drafting. It's got tile lane. It's got resources. Oh, it's right. just so good. And it was out of print for a long time. And then they just reprinted it like a year ago. Huzzah! Because it's so good, it deserves that. Because you've got this hand of cards that will give you, you got, that will give you resources and give you choices. And you've got this growing communal city. And you build up, Mandy, this whole building up yes. thing. If you can get your you know your little ownership tokens on higher levels you get more and more of them out there so it's got a little bit of area control almost as well it's an intriguing game it's very replayable it's beautiful it, it's just it's a great game if you haven't had a chance to play Ginkopolis because it was out of print for so long it's more easily available now and i highly recommend that you give it a look uh so i have actually never played it I have the new version because I was like, good, I don't good. have it. Let me get the new version. But I still haven't gotten it to the table. And I just because I have so many games uh, on the dock. I know. You got to push your friends, man, because it's, yeah, you, it's. Add it, add it to the pile, Suzanne. <laughs> okay. Just add okay. It to the pile. We'll play it. it. You. This list is obscene at this <laughs> it's, point. It's getting ridiculous. Uh, so the last game on my list, uh, I love Uwe games. And for the longest time, I actually didn't have this game. Uh, somebody else had taught it to me and I said, how come I don't have this game? It's so good. And I think it was just really hard to find at the time. And that is Glass Road. And I may have mentioned it once before on another uh, game pie, but um, I just, I really, I liked it so much that I went and bought it and spent a lot of money on this game. So you'd think I'd play it more than what I have, but very good. Uh, but it, it's again, a game where you are building and you have periods of where you're building different types of, and I think in this game, sorry, it's been a while since I played it. It's uh, cards that you're using uh, to build. And like Uwe games, you have like, you know, uh, a game board that has like areas for you to put things and you don't want to leave certain things open or you don't, you know, because then you could like lose points and 
the stress of this game, but so good. And I'm really obsessed with the wheel. Like there's like a, I don't know how you the describe. resource wheel, the resource wheel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I really like things like that. I like real multi-use cards and I like res- any type of wheel that has to give me resources or managing how that works. And it just looks really nice. So <laughs> if you're a new Bay fan, glass road is one, uh, don't sleep on it. I just, it is a, the, one of the lighter ones on, uh, his repertoire of games, but I do very much enjoy glass road. Excellent. Yeah, one of my all-time favorite games, Mandy. You have such great taste. Oh, as do you. Hmm. All right. Well, for my last city-building game pie slice, courtesy Mandy, Small City. It's in the name. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. In the Small name. City. I don't know why Alban VR called it Small City. It ain't nothing small about this game. It's got a big box. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's got a ton of pieces. Uh. And it's heavy. Like mechanically it. heavy. I don't know. Small city in my butt. But <laughs> all that said, it's great. So it's it's a game in which you are using polyomino shaped tiles that represent different building types, industry, residential. I mean, in some ways, it's very standard stuff. Uh, they come in all different shapes. And you're ultimately going to be placing them out on the board, trying to maximize on scoring because you don't want residential next industry and all this other stuff. There's some really clever mechanisms in how you use uh, people to get um, to, to get the tiles and get your actions. It's It's got a lot going on. It's hard for me to get to the table because it's got a lot going yeah, on. Yeah. But just like Clinic, Mandy, like you and I have played Clinic a mm-hmm. number of times together. And we just – like Alban does these massive – games that are very intimidating for your first play or two and right. then you just hit that rhythm and they just make sense and they're beautiful beautiful games and so small city actually just recently had a crowdfunding campaign for a new edition my the copy i have at home is years old but right. the new edition is now fulfilling actually very very yeah. soon and that will make the new edition much more easy for people to find and try themselves if you want a heavier city building game <laughs> And you're willing to push through that first play challenge. Yeah. Small City is a very rewarding, very satisfying city building game. <laughs> I don't have this one. I do have a few of his games, um, but um, I don't actually own this one. So this is one I was interested in looking at when I saw that they had done the the relaunch. I'll add it to the try. list, man. Add it to the list. But uh, oh, that's, that's some great stuff. And I'm glad you ended on that one because uh, on a solo stream, it was potentially going to do the Tramways uh, book, <laughs> nice, which is. Uh, another one of his games. So yeah, Small City. Very nice. There you go. All right. Well, dessert has been served. You know what that means? Podcast is wrapping up. How do you... Because you don't... You don't it's dessert. We're done. It's We're done. good timing. Like- my my house just got really noisy all of a sudden. So I'm like, I think it was a hint that I need to wrap. The dogs barged in and... Oh my goodness. I'm so <laughs> sorry, awesome everybody. <laughs> but there you have it, folks. Next episode... Uh, I will actually already, Mandy, we will actually, well, I will already be traveling to Gen Con when our next episode drops on August 2nd, I think. As will I. So so next episode, we'll be talking about Gen Con and what, you know, we're seeing or thinking and excited about uh, because we kind of missed origins. So we'll talk about Gen Con in our next episode. (laughs) So tune in for that. And, uh, Anything else that we need to bring up before we kind of... No, I think that's it. Yeah, so next episode, Gen Con. That's, that's, I think Gen that's Con. It. Ta-da. Yeah. We have a plan. We got a plan. As always, everybody, thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for putting up with us. Uh, <laughs> we, we love y'all. Uh, you can email us with questions. Uh, if you have any questions about Gen Con or you have anything that you want to bring to our attention about things that we definitely want to see, uh, let us know. You can email us at saltandsassgames at gmail.com. Or you can join us on our Board Game Geek Guild. Of course, that's guild number 4131 on boardgamegeek.com. We have a, a post for every episode there that you are welcome to jump in, chime in, comment, ask questions, what have you. Yes, and uh, well, the socials, you know, all the socials we're on, you're potentially watching the podcast here on the YouTube, and that's uh, Salt and Sass Games, and you can also find us on the Twitch with the same name. We're also on the Twitter, and we're spelled a little differently there, that's Salt and N SAS games, so no and, it's an N, Salt N SAS games, and you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, 
I think that's it. But if there are more, uh, it, you'll find me at 613Mandy, and that's Mandy with an I. How about you, Suzanne? And you can find me on almost, I can't, I haven't gotten on to Spill yet. Oh, gosh, there are more? <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't. Spill, Spoutable, Co-Host, Hi, Blue Sky. I am not personally doing threads yet. I saw that, I got but no. opinions on that one. No, uh, but I'm on all those places as 425 Suzanne. There you go. It's been a pleasure and privilege to be podcasting with you today. And we love being part of your extended gaming family. Thank you again for being here. And we just appreciate all of your support in all the various forms that it comes in. Until next episode, stay hydrated, stay cool, don't <laughs> overheat, be safe, be comfortable out there, folks, and play some games. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode was sponsored by Druid City Games, where player experience comes first. Check out all of their great games at druidcitygames.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please check us out on coffee.com forward slash salt and sass games. Thank you for your support. We are also a part of the Goonhammer Media Network. Check out more of their content on media.goonhammer.com. Salt and Sass is produced with love by Suzanne and Mandy, and we'll be back next episode with more salt, more sass, and more games.